preachers asked me to come and talk a little bit today about missions and about giving, faith promise giving, and then also regular giving. You have to tie it all together. And so I started thinking about what to do. And when, when you get a subject like that, and you've got one shot three times uh, in one day, that's a, that's a big job to try and lay everything out in a way that will be informative, helpful, and get the job done. We're living in a dangerous time. We're living in an unusual time. I personally believe, and I know a lot of men that are in the ministry believe this, that we're living in the days just prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus. I could take a whole service and tell you why I believe that. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. This is the second coming. If it isn't, God's got to do something. No matter what happens within the next five years, something miraculous is going to happen here. It has to. This, this world is crashing down around our shoulders. Everything, whether it's finances or education or industry or business, uh, it, it's, it's falling. It's failing. Everything's getting set up for where the Antichrist will come in. Now, if this isn't his time, something has to happen, something amazing and good. And I tell you, the only thing that will happen that will be good is if we get fired up for God and we get out there and win people to Christ. That's why we're in the mess we're in. You know, the unsaved, did, did you know that darkness cannot affect light? Um, I don't know what's through that door, but possibly a closet. If it is, then in that closet, it's dark. That darkness does not affect light. It can't affect light. There's nothing that darkness can do to if it impact light. But you know, light dispels darkness. The light is that which gives action. If that door is leading to a closet that's totally black in there, you open that door, all of a sudden light rushes in, and it dissipates the light or the darkness. We are light. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. He said, get out there and spread your light, and the darkness has us have a chance. It'll recede. What has happened is we have receded we have gone back, we've pulled in, and we've not reached the world with the gospel like we should. And so there isn't much light. So darkness is permeating the world. All the things that are going on. Did you ever think you'd live in a day when somebody was asked this question in an interview? What is a woman? And he refused to answer and couldn't answer. What is a woman? What is a man? I mean, that is really not hard. I wish that was on the final exam, that was on my final exam in, in, in college. I could have passed that with flying colors. But we're living in a day of craziness. We're living in a day where everything people have put their faith and trust in is collapsing around us. We have the answer. We are the answer. And that's why it's so important that we do something to get the gospel around the world, not just here at home. That's what Worldwide Missions is all about. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, Bear with me, I'm not sure how all this is going to fit together because there's a number of things I want to do. But to take your Bibles and let's open them to the book of Genesis. Now, stay with me for a few minutes because what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to say is not going to seem to have any relationship to giving or money or tithing or missions. Genesis. In chapter 1 and 2, God has, has created the world. God spoke this world into existence. Did you ever think about that? God didn't get a bunch of stuff and put it together and say, well, there's the world. God started with nothing. And he spoke and something occurred and something came out. And we saw the stars and the moon and the uh, universe's form. Don't let it bother you what the scientists say. You know, the, the farthest, I just heard this the other day, the farthest object that has ever been seen was just seen through the telescope that they've got out in space now. It's, it's the edge of the universe at the beginning of time. No, it's not. Well, this has existed for hundreds and millions and billions of light years. No, God created something with a history. You know what the problem is? Your God is too small. Your God can't take care of creating something that has a history. This world was created with a history to it. The universe was created with a history to it. Is the world, is the universe expanding? Yes. But it's not the outer edges of it from the Big Bang. It's when God spoke and he spoke worlds into existence that had a history. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 are about how God created the world. Then we come down to, to uh, verse 7, chapter 2. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God created man. That was his plan all along. All the worlds, all the universes, all the other things that are out there were not created for themselves or just for God. They were created for man. 
God finally, he said, all right, now we're down to my, my crowning achievement. I'm going to create man and woman. God created man, put him in the garden. Now, I want you to see this. Look at verse number 15. Verse number 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. What's that mean? That means God created a man and then gave him a, a responsibility, gave him work to do. What was the work? To take care of the garden. By extension, man was given the title deed to planet Earth. God said to Adam, this is your realm. This is what I'm giving you. He said, it's all for you here in this earth. All the stars, and what are they all about? I don't know what God had in mind. Maybe if man had never sinned, we'd be populating the stars. I don't know. I don't know what that was all about, but I know that God created it for man because God placed man in the garden and said, now you take care of it. This is your responsibility. Well, you know what happened after that? God created a woman, a man and a woman. Then from that, those two people came all the men and women that live today. You know, it's amazing that as I look out over the congregation, there's a, a lot of different complexions in here. There's some of us that are white face. Some of us are tan or brown face. Some of us are darker. Some of us uh, may have, have uh, different features, but you know what? We all came from two people, Adam and Eve. It's amazing. God said to Adam and Eve, he said, he guessed it to Adam and Eve, and eventually to Eve, he said, I want you to take care of all this. Adam went out and named all the animals. You know, scientists will tell you that early man was ignorant. They lived in caves and, and they couldn't talk. <laughs> no, they weren't. They were at the peak of their intellect. Adam gave, Adam gave the technical names, the biological names to all the animals. He was a brilliant man. God created him that way. No sin. Boy, it would be nice not to have to fight this whole body of sin, wouldn't it? Well, we'll be there one day. But he put Adam in the, he put Adam in the garden and gave Eve. Finally, let me, let me say this. As he was going along, God uh, created Eve. Why didn't God create Eve in the beginning? Well, what was the process? The process was Adam's out there naming the animals. And as he's doing it, because he is intellectual, something occurred to him. Daddy giraffe has a mama giraffe. Daddy elephant has a mama elephant. Adam has nobody. God created Adam, not, not with a defect. God didn't look down and say, oh, good night, I forgot about that. I, now what am I going to do? No. What God did is he created Adam with a need, but he waited until Adam expressed that need to him before he did anything about it. When that need was expressed, God created a woman out of, out of the side of Adam. Look down at verse number 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. This is, this is your, your job to take care of these trees, and this is what you're going to eat from. I think the first uh, 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 people on earth were vegetarians. They ate the fruit, they ate the vegetables that were there. God said, you got to take care of them. Now, there were no weeds growing. But you know, in a healthy, do you, do you know, who, if you know anything about fruit trees, fruit trees grow and grow and grow. In order to gain more fruit and better fruit, you know what you have to do to the fruit trees? Prune them. Now, you're not pruning them because weeds are there. You're not pruning them because there's a, a, a defect in the tree. You're pruning them because the tree is doing well and prospering and producing more fruit and more, and more branches and so on. But you have to prune them to keep them going. That's what Adam did. Adam didn't take care of weeds. There were no weeds in the garden. He pruned it. He took care of it so it would produce the best, the best fruit. That was his responsibility. Now, there was one limitation. What was that limitation? Look down. Verse 17. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt surely die. God intended for Adam and Eve to live upon the earth perpetually, eternally. That's what he created it for. And But God wanted to create man with a, an ability to choose. I've often said this as I witness to people. I say, you know, Back in Romans chapter uh, 10, it talks about having the heart and the mouth. The heart is where the desires are. The mouth is what expresses those desires so we can see them. I can't see your heart. And some of you out there may be looking at me thinking, boy, I don't like that guy. But you're smiling. Amen. And if you don't like me, that's all right. Just smile. Why? Because I don't know. I think you like me. <laughs> How do I know what's in your heart? 
by what's on your face. That's how we know that. That's why when you look at people, you ought to look at their faces and watch their faces. That will express that in the eyes especially will tell you what that person's thinking. God put Adam and Eve there in the garden. And you know the story. They failed. God's plan was for them to live upon the planet Earth. No sin, no problem. They had never met Satan at this point, as far as we know. And they're there in the garden to keep it and dress it and take care of it. Well, Adam and Eve sinned, you know that. And they lost it. All right, now from that point, now here's where we're going. I want you to understand that something changed at that point. Sin entered God's world for the first time. Now, sin was in the heart of Satan. Sin was in heaven when Satan fell. But sin did not come to the earth. God kept the earth. Why? That was his. He created it for Adam and Eve and their offspring. And he, he envisioned uh, just perpetual a birthing of children and, and a beautiful group of people that would love him and serve him and obey him. And so he, number one, gave Adam and Eve a law. One law. That tree, don't eat of that fruit. By the way, I think almost the name of that tree is deceptive. The tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They knew what good was. They had never experienced evil. God said, you don't need to know that. But Adam and Eve sinned and they failed. Now God planned for man to live here upon the earth. Now let me tell you a couple, show you a couple of things. Number one, who gave Adam the work to do? Talk to me. God. God did. All right. Then is God the owner or is God a, a, a worker? Who gives orders to the workers? The boss. All right? So God's the boss. There's only two people here, Adam and Eve. Or Adam and Eve. God and the Adam. God said to Adam, here's what I, I want you to do. So who's the owner? God. Whose garden is it? God's. God made it for Adam. Adam is what? A caretaker. He's to take care of that garden. He, he, he has the title deed to earth. He's been given the responsibility to take care of all the things that are on earth. But God said, don't eat the fruit of that one tree because this is the test to see if you will do what I want you to do with the little baby or not. And they failed. And when they failed, God said, then you're going to die. The process of death physically started in their body, but immediately they did dead spiritually. We find them trying to hide from God. Now, why do I say all that? Because I want you to understand something very important that has to do with finances, has to do with missions, has to do with giving. This world is not ours. You go to the back of the book, or the book of Revelation, and you'll see there in the beginning of time, Revelation, I think it's chapter 4, right in that area, there's weeping. Why? Because there's a seven-sealed book. When it says a book, it's not a book like your Bible. It's a book like a scroll. A seven-sealed scroll means there's seven pages, seven sheets to this, and each one's sealed. There's a seven-sealed scroll, and there was nobody found in heaven that was able to open it. Why? Because it could only be opened by one person, a person who had right to the property. Then they said, here comes Jesus. Jesus opens that seven-sealed scroll. Why? Because when he died, his blood paid the price to redeem this world and became his. This world is not ours. You know the problem we have today? We're comfortable. We're comfortable. We're comfortable in the world that we have. We like money. We like things. We like good cars and nice clothing and nice homes. We like all that stuff. And what we do is somehow along the way we, we lose sight of the fact this world is God's. It's not ours. This world can never be ours. The, the clothing you wore to church this morning is not yours, it's God's. The car you drove is not yours, it's God's. The house you live in is not yours, it's God's. The money you have in your pocket is not yours, it's God's. The job you have is not yours, it's God's. How do I know that? Because what's yours no one can take away. It's yours. You have a right to it. But you know what? One day you and I will lose everything. God brought Adam and Eve out of the garden. He said, now you've lost the title deed to the earth, but we're gonna use this earth for something else. We're gonna use this earth to allow you to lay up treasure in heaven for yourself. That which is yours, that which is real. Folks, one day, very soon, I believe, this old world is gonna be burned up. The heavens and earth will be burned up and a new heaven and earth God will create, why? Because this heaven and earth was marred by sin and wickedness. And God says, I'm not gonna allow that for eternity. 
I'm going to give man what he wanted, what I wanted to give him in the beginning, a garden that's beautiful, a world that's without, without blemish, a world without sin. Boy, wouldn't it be nice to have a world without sin? That means when you drive your car home tonight, you could just leave the keys in it and nobody would bother it. That means when you walk downtown, you wouldn't wonder if somebody's going to run up and hit you in the head. That means that nobody's going to, you could leave your, your cell phone on the table when you went to the restroom in the restaurant. And it'd be there when you got back because nobody's going to steal it. Those are just a few things. What I'm trying to do is get you to understand on a basic level, this world is not ours. Nothing here is ours, but it's here for a purpose. God placed it in our hands. And Jesus, he told many parables. I'm going to take one in the morning service, and I'm going to give that a parable because it illustrates so well what I'm talking about. But he gave many parables of the master going away and giving the garden to his, his servants to take care of it. Then coming back and finding some had done well and some had done poorly and some did nothing. He's showing us that this is not ours. But you can use that which is not yours to accomplish something great for yourself. Tithing. Giving. And then of course <clears throat> faith promise giving is so vitally important. All giving, <clears throat> excuse me, all giving, you hear people say, well, it's, 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 it's free will giving, free will offerings. There was never a free will offering in the Bible. God designed all giving. Oh, look, look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was a herdsman, Cain was a farmer. Process of time it came to pass that Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. And Abel brought it off, brought to the first thing, brought, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering. But unto Cain, to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. The story is very simple. Adam and Eve, <coughs> the only two people upon the earth, came together and they had children. Two of those children were named Adam, Cain and Abel. Cain, he became a, <coughs> excuse me, he became a tiller of the ground. He became a, a farmer. Abel became a shepherd, a herdsman. He had different herds, different sheep. It came at a point in time when an offering was to be offered. Now, you read that account, and there's some things that aren't said, but from the things that are said, we can assume certain things. Would it be, I, I want you to respond to me, okay? Would it be right for somebody to expect that you do something in a certain way, but never tell you, and then when you didn't do it that way, chastise you for it? Is that, would that be right? No. Yes or no? No. No. That's why when you have children, <clears throat> you say, go clean up your room. <clears throat> they go and throw something here and something there, and you go back in and say, you didn't clean this room up, it's still a mess. Did you tell them what you wanted done? Did you tell them how to clean the room, what's supposed to be done? That the toys are to be put in the toy box, closed in the closet? Did you explain to them? If you didn't, whose fault is it that they didn't do it? It's your fault. So we can assume <clears throat> from this, <clears throat> from this uh, portion of scripture that someplace along the line, God explained to Adam and Eve what the offerings were to be, what kind of an offering, when they were to be offered. And in the process of time, when the children are born, <clears throat> they came and brought their offerings at the time that was prescribed. Now, one offering was accepted, Abel's. One offering was rejected, Cain's. Why? Abel's was a blood offering. Cain's was not. So that soon, I'm assuming now, from knowing that this is Old Testament, that that was an offering for sin. Cain did it his way. Abel did it God's way. God said, here is the, when the offering should be, be brought. And there was no criticism when the offering was brought. And here's the type of offering you're to bring. There is the criticism. Cain, you didn't listen. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. You did it the wrong way. So what I learned from this, from the very first in, in, instance of giving in the Bible, God directed it. God directs all giving. Abel's was accepted. God alone determines what's accepted and what is not accepted. Ours is to simply obey God. Now that comes down to today. Our giving is not what we think we want to do and the way we want to do it. Our giving is to be done the way God says. 
It's to be done as God purposes in his heart for us to do it. When do we see tithing in the Bible? First instance of tithing is over in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 20. Or 14, probably, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. We come to Abraham. It says, Abraham blessed the most high God, which delivered thine enemies into his hand. Abraham had just fought a great battle. And uh, he's freed Lot. God's given him a great victory. On the way back from the battle, he runs into a man, verse 18, called Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is sort of a quandary in Scripture, a puzzle. We're not sure exactly who he was. He was a king, the king of Salem. Um, he was a priest. He's a picture of Christ if he was not a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ. But regardless of that, he was a, somebody that Abraham recognized as a spiritual uh, entity and somebody that was higher than he was. Verse 19, he blessed him and said, Blessed be, of, be Abraham of the Most High God, profess, pro, possessor of heaven and earth. Who possesses heaven and earth? God. Remember that. This world is not ours. This is God's world. So he blessed the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Abraham gave tithes. Tithe is 10%. He gave tithes multiple to this fellow by the name of Melchizedek. That's the first tithing example that we have. When Jacob gets saved, he's running from Esau. He comes to that place in Bethel. He lays down to sleep that night and he has a vision. I believe that night he got saved. But he wakes up and he promises God some things. He promises God to go home. He promises God to serve. And he promises God he's going to start tithing and giving. Tithing was obviously something that he understood. It was something that was established as a believer's responsibility. But Jacob was disobedient. Jacob is not a good example of obedient Christianity. A, Jacob was somewhat of a rebel. He was a deceiver. That's what his name meant, deceiver. He was a, a person that was used of God, but he wasn't a good example of a lot of things that he did. When we give God, we start with the tithe. God said you're supposed to tithe, you're supposed to give, you're supposed to do this. Why are we tithing? What is the purpose of the tithe? Well, it's not about money. God does not need money. You realize that, don't you? God took care of two million Jews wandering in the wilderness. They never planted anything. They couldn't have herds or cattle or anything like that. He took care of them every day. He fed them every day from heaven, manna. God could drop $20 bills on your lawn tomorrow morning if you wanted to. That's not what it's about. Tithing is about trusting. It's about faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. There's a, a prayer in the Bible we call the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the disciples' prayer. It's a model that was given to them by Jesus when they asked him, Master, teach us to pray. He taught them why they should pray, and he taught them in this prayer why they should pray. The Lord's Prayer goes, Our Father, which art in heaven. When you approach God, you approach Him as a Father, not just as an overriding God that is, is scary and, 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 and vicious and trying to dis destroy us. It's our Father, our Heavenly Father. Christianity is the only religion in the world that has a God that is our Father and loves us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for the coming of the kingdom. I'm looking for the coming of the king, first of all. He's going to establish a kingdom. He's going to rule it. I'm looking forward to that. No sin, no sickness, no death, no, no disturbances of any sort. What a wonderful time that's going to be. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How's it done in heaven? Instantly. Remember, the disciples were arguing and, and, and grousing about the fact that they had this problem and that problem. And, and, and Jesus came to them and said, look, why are you concerned? Don't be concerned about what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, what you're going to wear. God takes care of the animal kingdom. They aren't concerned about it. You never saw a bird walking back and forth on a, on a power line, wondering, wings behind his back, wringing his wings, saying, oh, where am I going to get my food tonight? Who's going to feed me? God feeds them. God takes care of them. And, and then he says, hey, you worry about those things. Here's your prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, wait a minute. 
You know that prayer, you memorize it. Did you ever stop and think what you're asking for? God, I need a new, new Lexus. Well, there's a dealer right next door here. You can go get one. God, I, 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 I need some food. I, I want to fill my three freezers and two refrigerators. God, I need this, I need that. God says, ask for your daily bread. Daily. I'll guarantee you, in this group here, I might be mistaken. I, I, would, I would almost bet every dime I have of the 20 cents I've got in my pocket that none of you here, if I would go home with you and say, let me look in your cupboards, let me look in your refrigerator, you would have nothing in there. Nothing. If you've got a teenage boy, you've heard that many times. Dad, there's nothing to eat! You go open the doors and the refrigerator and the cupboard and everything. There's plenty of food. What it means is there's no cold pizza. What that means is there's nothing that I want to eat. I want you to go out and get my type of food. There's plenty of food. We've got plenty. God says, don't ask for, for that which is not needed right now. Ask for your daily bread. Why? Because you're going to start depending on supermarkets. It's like the, the kid that mommy said, ask him, do you, do, you, do you know where hamburger comes from? Yeah, the supermarket. No, hamburger comes from the cow. The cow is out in the field. The farmer's taking care of the cow. That's where beef comes from. You're eating a cow. If you want to turn your child into a vegetarian, that might do it. God wants us to learn that our dependence for everything in this world is on him. This is not our life. This is not our world. This is his world. He says, pray for your daily bread. The Bible says, having food and raiment, let us there with be content. Raiment means having clothes to put on. I've traveled the world. I've been in 32 countries of the world at least. I remember when we were in the Philippines one time, <clears throat> we went to this house of a, a pastor. His home was literally on the city dump. Why was he there? Because there were thousands of people living on that dump and he wanted to reach them with the gospel. Somebody had to go. I remember when we went, we, we, we came into the property, and I don't remember whether we didn't let him know we were coming or what, but, but uh, the, all of a sudden the mother is scurrying around with the kids. The kids are running around, they had no clothes on. Why? Because the one suit of clothes they had, the one shirt, the one pair of pants, was washed and hanging on the line drying. But you know what I found there? Two people who were perfectly content serving God, having food and raiment. They didn't have to have closets full. We got so much. You know what? I, I, I'm not sure about this in Canada. I know it's true in America. One of the biggest businesses is storage facilities. Is that true here? They're building them everywhere. Taking old buildings and turning them into, you lock it, you keep it, you come and get it. We don't, we don't have room in our houses for the stuff that we have. So we buy out, we rent other buildings, we put our stuff in, and we go and visit our stuff once or twice a year. What, how much do we need? Having food and raiment. See, we get too far from that point where we have a need, a real need, and we won't live by faith. Let me take just a minute. Uh, some of you might have recognized some things about me. About two months ago, I was diagnosed with the beginning of Parkinson's disease. They, they can't tell whether you really got it or not. They just use symptoms. One of the symptoms is what they call facial masking. I look like I'm serious all the time. I'm not. That's just my muscles in my face don't work like they used to, so that I'm not as smiling as I used to be. Another thing is sometimes you have tremors. So just so you know, you can try to figure out what's wrong with me. I'll tell you what's wrong with me. My wife, if don't ask her, she'll tell you more things that are wrong with me. <laughs> but I live like a missionary does. Years ago, I decided when I started the mission board, I was not going to take a salary from anybody. I was going to get support just like a missionary does from the housing, from their, their, their churches. The reason I did that is I wanted to know how they lived. I wanted to experience what they were experiencing. When they have a down month, I want them to know I have down months. When the economy dips and then all of a sudden you start losing church support, I lose church support. I've lived that way. As a matter of fact, I've lived probably less on less than most of them have because the last person in the line to get something is the administrator. Everybody wants to support the guy that's out there on the field, and that's fine. But I've had to learn to walk by faith. My wife and I have walked by faith for many years now. 
We've been in ministry full time for almost 50 years. I'm 78 years old, two or three weeks ago. I have no plans to quit. I I'm, I'm, have issues physically that I fight and I deal with. I don't plan on quitting. I don't plan on giving up because the economy is bad. Why? I want to serve the Lord until the end. I want to walk by faith. I want to trust Him. When I don't have the strength, I'm going to pray and ask Him to give me the strength. When I don't have the resources, I'm going to ask Him to... Folks, that's how God wants us to live. Why? This world is not... You can't stock it up. Now, I'm not opposed to it. When I say that, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not opposed to you putting some groceries away or some money away in a savings account. I'm not opposed to you taking, taking care to take care of your family because the economy is questionable and we don't know what's going to happen. I'm not opposed to that. What I'm opposed to is you thinking that what you put away is going to take care of you. It's not. God's going to do it. This is his world. This is his world. The tithe is our payment to God for living in his world. That's what the tithe is. It's just showing God that we're going to trust him. The tithe, 10%, 10% isn't a big amount. It's big enough that it hurts when we give it sometimes because we know that we have other needs. It's big enough that it makes a difference when we do give it. And yet it's not so big that nobody could do it. If it was 50%, there's a whole bunch of us that would say, ooh, I don't know about that one. 10%, we can do 10%. It's going to be a stretch. We have to trust God, and that's what he wants. But you know what? The Bible tells us one day our giving here on this earth is going to result in his giving to us in heaven. Adam lost the document, the deed to planet earth. This wasn't his planet anymore. He's not going to live from this planet. He's not going to live here forever. He's not going to lay up treasure forever. And he could never get it back. We can't get it back. We can't earn it back. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came and died. He did for us what we couldn't do. There's no way I can earn my land title to planet Earth. You know what I'd have to do? You know what you'd have to do? You'd have to live a perfect life. Not one sin. Not one blemish. Not one thing wrong. The problem is by the time I knew that that was what I had to do, I'd already sinned. I was already a sinner. This world can never be mine. Jesus knew that. God knew that. So he sent his son Jesus down from heaven to earth, lived here a perfect life for 33 years. Taught us about heaven, taught us about hell, taught us about Jesus. They taught God. He came down. And then he paid the, the ultimate price when he went to the cross. He died. He died and he paid our hell for us. He paid the price to redeem not just man, but planet earth and the world that God created. He has, a, he has the deed to this. And he says, you want to come along with me? Accept me as your, your payment. Accept me as the only way. Accept me, and I'll give it to you. One day we're going to cross over to the other side. One day we're going to go to heaven. One day Jesus is coming for us again. When that occurs, then we're going to be in, in, in able to inherit that which is ours. The homes and whatever, whatever God has prepared for us, we'll be able to inherit. When, on what basis are we going to receive that? How faithful we've been with what was God's. You want to see how a man's going to treat you? See how he treats that which is somebody else's. You know, a lot of times people say, well, this, is, this, this car belongs to somebody else. I, I borrowed it. And we don't treat it right. This world belongs to God. How are you treating it? Are you being faithful? Are you doing what he asks you to do? Are you tithing? That's where we begin as a tithe. Faith promise giving is a plan that you're not going to hear that or see that title or that, that phrase mentioned in the Bible. Faith promise giving, though, is, is a, a mixture of two things, faith and promise. Turn back to 2 Corinthians. Chapter number 9. Uh, just put your finger there a minute. I want you to look at one other set of verses. Turn to Psalm. Uh, I'll find it here in just a second. Psalm chapter 50. Just want to underscore what I've been talking to you about. 
Down in verse 8, it says, I will not, God speaking, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices, for thy burnt offerings, to have him been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goes out of thy fields. Every beast of the forest is mine. See that? That, that beast that you're out hunting, you go out and hunt. Go out for a deer. You get a deer, you bring it home and cook it up. So that, that deer of yours was good. It's not your deer, it's God's deer. The beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine. Folks, could it be any clearer that we don't own anything? Suppose one of you came to me at the end of the service and said, Brother Cox, I know this is going to be a strange request, but my wife has got to make a a trip to the hospital this afternoon and our car is broken down. I know you could be with the preacher. You won't need a car. Would you loan me your car? It would not be right for me to loan you that car and then you take it and drive it any way you want and do whatever you wanted with it. Say, so, well, I, I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to take a trip. I'm going to take it off and we're going to go on a three-day trip someplace. That wouldn't be right. It's not your car. It's my car. It wouldn't be right for you to let your kids get in with muddy boots on and walk all over the seats and things. Why? It's not your car. It's my car. Treat it the way that you would your own, even though it's not yours. That's what God said about this world. You can't live in this world any way you want to live. That's why he gave us a book and told us how to live our life. That's why he told us how to give and what we should do. This world is his, and we ought not rebel when he tells us how to live and what to do with it. This is his world. Amen. I love that statement. If I was hungry, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't tell you. You don't need to tell you. I don't need to tell you. This isn't your world. This is my world. You go out and get a beast, it's my beast. We serve a great God, don't we? Back in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, down in verse 6, Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to give for the church at Jerusalem. That is missions giving. When you have church people in one country giving to the help of an aid and of people in another country, it says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. This is a principle. He's using agriculture. If you go out and you sow in the field an acre, and the guy next to you sows 10 acres of seed, which of you is gonna have the biggest harvest, everything else being equal? The guy that sowed the most. He said, the more you give out, the more you put out, the more you sow, the more you're going to receive. That ought to help us and encourage us to give. To give our tithe, to give offerings above the tithe. When you come to any offering other than the tithe, the tithe, God says, is 10%. 10% of your gross product, your gross income. Other than that, he said, I'm not telling you how much to give. If we pass an offering plate around this morning, a preacher said the steers are here, and they're a good missionary couple, and uh, they have some physical needs and material needs, I want to take up an offering for them. God didn't tell you what to give and put in that offering plate. He didn't say put something in. He didn't say don't put something in. He didn't say give them $10 or give them $10,000. Now you've got to go to God and say, God, tell me what you want me to do. Guide and direct me. Because I believe all giving is directed by you. This money I have in my pocket, this money I have in the bank, it's not my money, it's your money. I was preaching in a small church, I mean small, maybe there were 120 people there in the morning service. That night there were probably were 40 or 50 there at max. I preached on, on, on missions and, and then I told what was going on in Nigeria and with the city of refuge and the needs that we had there working with the Muslims who are getting saved. And, at the end of that service, the pastor came up and did something I've never had a man do. He came up and said, Preacher, I know this is going to sound a little odd. Would you and your wife mind going through that door and there's a little room over there, just sit in that room for a while? Never had anybody tell me to do that. That's strange. What did I do? I went inside that room, came back out. He said, Preacher, God spoke to us in the morning service and spoke to me and, and I wanted to bring something before the people. Before I left that night, this church was without a pastor. So we want to give you one half, 50% of everything in our savings account of the church to be used for the Muslim community in Nigeria, reaching them with the gospel. See, that's what it is. It's going out and letting the Lord speak to your heart and then doing what God tells us to do. 
who is to do it? Verse 7, every man according as he purposes in his heart. The first part, back up in, in verse number 6, is, is the giving part. Giving by faith. Giving what God tells you to give, even if you don't think you can afford it. What's going to happen in the future? Folks, if there's anything the last two years should have taught us, is we don't know what the future holds. No matter how much money, I was just listening coming in to, to the church this morning on the radio, it said 401ks in America, 401k savings accounts, is that, I think, what they be familiar with that? It's a savings account, 401k is a savings account that's not taxed until you take the money out. And so it grows and, and better. It's what we're using in America now for a lot of retirement funds. People put so much money in, sometimes their business puts, matches it, and then that grows and grows and grows until retirement time comes when your, your tax, uh, taxable uh, amount is less than it would have been when you were younger, and you begin to withdraw that money and live on it. The average 401k now is below six figures. That's a lot of money, but it's not if you're gonna live for another 20 years after you quit working. A lot of people are looking at that, they're saying, I told my wife, I said, my, my 401k's been over six figures for a long time, ever, never been up. I'm lucky if I have $2.98 in my 401k. The people are, are looking at that and they're saying, well, how, how are we gonna make it? Without God, you aren't. You aren't. You can't protect yourself. You can't protect yourself. You got all the plans, got all the money set aside. And then all of a sudden you have a stroke. Now what's going to happen? You're going to have enough money. I don't know what it's like here in, in Canada. Canada's a little different in their health care system. In America, long-term care, we have to pay for ourselves or we have to have insurance, private insurance. $10,000 a month is not unusual. You can have $100,000 in the bank and it's gone in less than a year. Taking care of your dad, taking care of your wife. You don't know. So what do you do? You worry. No, you trust God. You trust God. That's the faith part. Here's the promise part. Every man according as he purposes in his heart. You get on your knees before God and say, God, tell me what's putting this offering plate this morning. Tell me if there's something more you want me to give. God, tell me what you want me to give for missions to help reach the lost and the dying world for Christ. God, what is it you want me to put in that plate? Now, this is not in place of your tithe. This is in addition to the tithe. Say, God, what do, you, what do you want me to do? And then when God tells you, you do it. You promise God, you say, God, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. James says that we're double-minded. Why? Because we won't do what God tells us. If we would do what God would tell us, God would bless us. But we don't do it. We do a half-hearted way. We do a half-hearted thing. Every man has purpose is hard, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity. For God loveth the church, will give her. Do you ever wonder if God loved you? Here it is in black and white. I guarantee you, you can determine that God loves you. How? Be a cheerful giver. What's that mean? That means when you put your tithe in, you're not going, oh, man, I could use that as a brand new fishing boat. Not grudgingly. Well, I guess I'm going to have to do it. The preacher will be on my case. We're going to have to have another preacher going to come in and talk about giving. No, he said, give lovingly, happily, joyfully. God loves a cheerful giver. He loves you when you give that way. Verse number nine, eight. Here's the promise. Here's why we can do that. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. He said, you do these two things. You find out from God what he wants you to do, then you can do it cheerfully and lovingly and, and happily, and I'll give you everything you need. Verse number 10. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, that's God. The guy that provides seed to the man going out and sowing in the field, that's God. Minister both bread for your food and multiply your seed sown. Man, that's what we want, bread for our food. As I, you, you see that? God gives us seed. We go out and sow the seed in the field. That's an act of faith. That seed could rot in the field if there's too much moisture. That, field could bake, that seed could bake in the field and die of, of drought because there's no rain. God says, I'll take care of you. You, you do what I tell you to do. You, you have no other hope except me. I'll take care of you. He said, I'm not going to do that, but I'll provide for you from that which you sow bread. 
That which you sow will come back to you as, 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 as part of that which you need. Bread for the sower, multiply your seed sowing. That's the rewards that we're going to get one day. The Bible says, be careful you don't lose what you sow. You know what that means? It doesn't mean God's going to take something away. Do you remember the Apostle Paul said, uh, I count all that I've done in my past life as dung. I count it as loss. You remember that verse? What does he talk about loss? He's not the, sometimes we talk, we think about standing before the judgment seat of Christ. There's two major misconceptions. Number one, we think that God's going to bring out all of our sins to show it to us. Friend, I've got some good news for you. If you're born again and you're saved, you will never see your sin again. It does not exist. Christ took it and paid for it completely. Amen? Now, then there's, what's the purpose of the judgment? Well, I didn't say your sin didn't have an impact on you. It does. Your sin is, as we, as we commit sin, as we sin against the Lord, we lose certain things. The money that you are... If, if the if the don't get excited, preacher. I, I'm using this just an illustration. If this afternoon I said to the preacher, hey, get your family together and let's let's go down to Toronto. I want to buy you and your family a, a steak dinner at the best, most expensive steakhouse in Toronto. You know what? I could do that. Spend a lot of money. Well, I couldn't do that. Spend a lot of money. If I had a lot of money, I could do it. But you know what? I'm not going to earn any rewards in heaven for it. That same amount of money, let's say that was four or $500, which is not unreasonable for an expensive steakhouse and the number of children a preacher has. If you'd only have one, that would be... But that means that money can't be invested in Bibles to give to people that don't have one. That means that money is money that can't be given to the church so that they can find a facility that's available all the time to use for the church. That means that money is money that could not be used for missionaries and help them to win people to Christ around the world. You're losing the opportunity to gain because this world is not yours. That which you have here is not ours. We're going to leave it all behind. Some people are going out of here impoverished as Christians spiritually. Why? They've invested in this world only. Invest in this world. You've got to eat. You've got to have clothes. You've got to have a place to live. You've got to have a car. And I'm not opposed to you having any of those things that are nice. I'm just saying, what is it you really want? Understanding this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're heading to heaven. In heaven is that which is going to be ours eternally. It's that which we're laying up. How? By investing in spiritually. What can we invest in that's eternal? There's only three things I know that are eternal. Number one, the Word of God. Now, you could invest in that in a sense by buying Bibles and giving them to people that don't have them and trying to win people to Christ. But in a sense, you can. The Bible is written. It's exact. It's what it should be. There's nothing you can do to it. Number two is God. God doesn't need your money. He owns everything already. You're just borrowing it for a while and we leave it behind. You get to be my age. You realize how true that is. We're just using it. I have nothing. I have nothing of my own, except what I sent ahead. That's number three. The third thing is eternal, the souls of men. Invest in getting people saved. Invest in getting the gospel out. Invest in, and you're laying up treasure in heaven. There is nobody. I don't care whether it's Bill Gates. I don't care whether it's, it's uh, Zuckerberg or any of those guys that have billions of dollars. They have nothing. They're leaving it all one day. What have they sent on ahead? What are you sending on ahead? As you come to missions giving, realize I don't have time to go to Romans chapter 10. Read Romans chapter 10. God's plan is to send people with his word to people who've never heard. Give them the gospel. You know the answer to every problem we have is the gospel. Winning people to Christ. The Muslim terrorists, what's the answer there? More guns? No. Armies that surround them know, win them to Christ. Win them to Christ. That's what it's all about. Win them to Christ. It's amazing what's happening in our world. The answer is win them to Christ. Invest in that. Why? Well, you, you, you're not going to keep this. Keep these thoughts in your mind in the morning service. We're going to preach a message that Jesus preached. 
to illustrate this very point. Father, thank you for the time you've given to us. I pray that this lesson, though it was somewhat rambling, was a help. As we've tried to lay a foundation of what giving is all about, by a foundation of fact that this world is not our world. The things in this world that we have in our hands are just to be used by us. They're not ours. Father, help us to understand that we can use that which is yours, that which has been given to us to lay up treasure in heaven for our son, treasures in heaven for us that will never be taken away. Thank you for what you've done, Lord. Watch over us on the morning service in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Let's uh, live, live for the eternal, not just for the, the, the temporal. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome.